you will see a pop-up window and you need to press allow to be able to continue. So welcome to the fourth webinar in our research seminar as part of the transnational cultural and visual studies research theme uh, led by myself, my colleagues, Nick Hodgin and Abdullah Gurney. So uh, my name is Abdel, I'm a lecturer in translation and interpreting here at Cardiff University and I'll be chairing today's uh, meeting alongside my colleague, Professor Kate Griffith. So we are extremely delighted and honoured to uh, welcome uh, Professor Lawrence Venuti, who will be talking to us today about the trouble with subtitling is a matter of interpretation. As we wait for the rest of the attendees, may I ask you to scan the, the QR code that is on the screen or just go to menti.com and insert that code just to give us an indication about which part of the world you're joining us from. I'll leave that to work in the background and I'll do some housekeeping notes. So after Professor Venuti has uh, spoken, we will open the floor to, to questions. You can post your questions at any point uh, during the, the talk using the Q&A uh, function, the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screens. Um, you can upvote each other's questions, which will give us an indication about a question's popularity. Following the talk, you would also be able, if you prefer to ask Professor Venuti your question live, you would be able to do so by using the raise hand function, also at the bottom of your screen. I would just like to note and ask you kindly to not use the raise hand function during the talk. We will be lowering the hand just to minimize any disruption, but you are very welcome to use it following the talk. So, Following the uh, Q&A session, there will be a survey, which you are all encouraged to take part in. It will give us uh, an indication about which talks you would like to see coming from us in the future and will help us a great deal. So without further ado, I hand over to uh, Professor Damien Walford Davis, our Pro Vice Chancellor for the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences to welcome Professor Venuti to Cardiff University. So thank you, Damien, uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Abdul. Uh, well, pleasure you met with Chris Awichi of Edward Bambid in our year to give the ad Rithiol Hun. Can you bend my thruskal estin croiso in Shrad of Gua for Funigane, Chrysalwade, Key Destino, Avid Gabithion, can Hessel Croiso? So I have the pleasure, as you've just heard from Abdul, uh, welcoming you all virtually to Cardiff University in Wales. Meeting virtually like this, um, owing to COVID, gives a new meaning, I think, to phrases that this evening's distinguished speaker has himself offered in the context of the ethics of translation. Are we tonight sending the reader abroad or bringing the author back home? Both probably, given how we've been configured by Zoom and by Skype and by Teams as uncannily both home and away. So before Professor Kate Griffiths welcomes you to the School of Modern Languages and introduce her specifically, I'd like to invoke for some a few minutes some cultural context and reveal certain links that I hope will enhance the warmth and relevance of our transnational Welsh welcome. So for us in Cardiff, um, as many of you know, a multi-ethnic, multilingual city that is part of an officially bilingual nation Translation of various kinds is a daily lived reality and a constant creative prompt. For us in Cardiff University, translation is a product and tool of research and teaching, including discipline defining work in the schools of Welsh, modern languages, English communication and philosophy, in fields such as bilingualism, language acquisition, language policy, pedagogy, and the discursive practice of speakers as well as the historicization of translation in the formation of cultural identity, of course. And all that in a location of culture in a devolved but non-state nation in which translation and interpretation are key tools, not only of our legislated bilingualism, but of our literary culture and of a civic culture also in which a Welsh translation industry thrives. Now, the traffic between languages and languages 
acts of resistance to that trafficking also have been key to so many experiences and campaigns that have formed us as Welsh citizens. Linguistic survival, nation building, lexi lexical modernization, and the creation and performance and wider dissemination of our literary tradition in both official languages. Finally, um, <clears throat> I wanted to say that I have the pleasure of being one of the team of translators who interpret the Welsh poems of Mena Elvin. And these translations, if that's of course quite the word, then appear alongside their Welsh originals in her bilingual editions. And it's a format that does sometimes, as I'm sure you can guess, have the uncanny effect of questioning that hierarchy between original and translation. Now she has a poem called Kisan Hankes, Handkerchief Kiss, which is a statement about the politics and the ethics, the aesthetics, the erotics, one might say, so the uncanny gift of translation in a Welsh English context. And the poem's numbers repost to a statement made by the Welsh poet R.S. Thomas. He said that a poem in translation is like kissing through a handkerchief. Um, Mena Elvin's poem is seemingly a corrective to that, which celebrates her own commitment to an unashamedly bifocal world of facing page lyrics in Welsh and in English that send the Welsh language out to the world in its original form and in borrowed English garb. But at the same time, the poem's imagery, as you'll see in a moment, reveals an anxiety and a guilt about some of the deathly aspects of translating from a minority culture's language. The handkerchief conjuring not only hiddenness, if you like, but something shroud-like, and with it, of course, the jealousy of Othello, as you'll see. So I welcome you on behalf of Cardiff University with this layered thing, Mena's poem in Joseph Clancy's translation, which gives me the added bonus of being able to remind us that our speaker this evening commissioned translations from Joe Clancy of the Welsh prose writer Kate Roberts back in 1999 for the Borderline series. So the poem, which is a short one, goes like this. A poem in translation is like kissing through a handkerchief, R.S. Thomas. A caress in the dark. What a tame lot we were with our secretive yesterday's kisses. Today it's a common greeting and we watch on the small screen world leaders deal peace with a cold embrace, an adder's kiss. The lyric translated is like kissing through a hanky, said the bard. As for me, I hug those poems between pages that bring back the word lovers. Let the poem carry a handkerchief and leave on my lip it's ailed kiss. Kate. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not entirely sure how I follow that. That was uh, <laughs> rather impressive. <laughs> okay, um, my name is Professor Kate Griffiths. I'm head of school in modern languages. I am beyond delighted <laughs> to welcome <clears throat> Professor Lawrence Fanuti on behalf of the School of Modern Languages here in Cardiff. His work features on every level of the years that we teach from first years to finalists, from master's students to PhD students. It's a key re reference point for the research outputs of our scholars on translation, of translation. His work shapes what we do and who we are as a community of translators. His work has shaped translation studies as a discipline more broadly. It's hard to overstate the impact he has had as a scholar on global translation studies a fact underlined by the audience for today's talk. Nearly 900 of you signed up worldwide to hear Professor Venuti speak today. Welcome one, welcome all. Such is the impact of the work of Professor Venuti that he needs in some senses no introduction, but I'm going to try. He's a translation theorist and historian who translates from Italian, French and Catalan. His list of publications is both extensive in its range and paradigm shifting in its content. I started to write it down and then I had to stop because there is that much uh, that has come. He is most recently the author of Contra Instrumentalism, a translation polemic, 2019, the editor of the Translation Studies Reader, fourth edition 2021, and the translator of J.V. Foy's day book, uh, 1918, Early Fragments, 2019. 
Professor Venuti's paper today is entitled The Trouble with Subtitling is a Matter of Interpretation, and I, for one, cannot wait. Over to you, Professor Venuti. Thank you, Kate and Damien, for the, for the very warm welcome. I'm very honored uh, to be here. Uh, greetings from the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Uh, I'm going to um, share a PowerPoint and read a text. It's the best way, I think, to deliver this information, the most coherent way, uh, especially in this format. So let me do it like this. Okay. Over the past two decades, the literature on subtitling in translation studies has grown into a flood of journal articles and research monographs, edited volumes and conference proceedings, instruction manuals and bibliographies, dissertations and theses. Yet the fundamental approach to translation in most of this literature, whether presupposed or formulated explicitly, has remained remarkably unchanged. In a 2011 book entitled Subtitling Norms for Television, Jan Pedersen asserts that, and I quote, interlingual subtitling is unique in that the message is not only transferred from one language to another, but also from one mode to another, from the spoken mode, usually, to the written mode, end of quote. Christine Sponholz's 2003 undergraduate thesis at Johannes Gutenberg Universität Mainz entitled Teaching Audiovisual Translation, likewise asserts at the outset that, and I quote, interlingual subtitles transfer the meaning of utterances, end of quote. And in her survey of translation programs at Western European universities, first among the special skills that faculty want students to acquire is the, quote, ability to select and condense the essence of a message. In a conference paper from 1991, Henrik Gottlieb, who worked as a subtitler in Danish television for a decade before becoming a scholarly specialist in the field, admits that, and I'm quoting, often subtitles are indeed less than a true representation of the original message. But he nonetheless asserts that, quote, a, a conscientious and talented subtitler is able to operate with a minimal loss of information, end of quote. Such statements rest on a particular concept of translation, what I'm going to call the instrumental model, whereby the subtitle is assumed to reproduce or transfer an invariant contained in or caused by the speech on a film soundtrack, whether it's form, its meaning, or its effect. Hence, in an entry on subtitling in the 1998 edition of the Routledge Encyclopedia of Translation Studies, Gottlieb acknowledges that, I'm quoting here, intentions and effects are more important than isolated lexical elements. But he does not consider how this devaluation of the word as the unit of translation might affect the communication of intended meanings and verbal effects. Instead, he implicitly treats these meanings and effects as unchanging essences embedded in the dialogue or the voiced over commentary on the soundtrack. And the subtitle is believed to be their reproduction in whole or in sufficient part that any loss is inconsequential. When the notion of loss is invoked in this instrumental approach to subtitling, it is not associated with any argument for untranslatability, but rather underpinned by an essentialist concept of languages, of language that facilitates translation, making it seemingly unproblematic. More remarkable still is Gottlieb's statement that the pragmatic dimension of speech acts, as he puts it, leaves the subtitler free to take certain linguistic liberties because of the material constraints of the medium, the conventional limitation of the subtitle to two lines each consisting of no more than roughly 35 to 40 keystrokes, both characters and spaces at the bottom of the frame. These liberties involve what Gottlieb terms a quantitative dialogue reduction, 
Pedersen cites statistics to suggest that, and I'm quoting, the quantitative condensation rate may average a third of the dialogue in a film. But this relatively high rate does not lead him to question whether a subtitle in, does in fact reproduce a semantic invariant. In his view, quoting, Gottlieb has shown that there is not a qualitative loss of information of the same amount. Instead, what is condensed is spoken language features, such as repetitions and false starts. And besides, viewers are compensated through other channels, mainly visual. So the total loss of information is not as dire as the quantitative figures suggest." End of quote. On the contrary, argues Gottlieb, even deliberate speech, including script-based narration, may contain so much redundancy that a slight condensation will enhance rather than impair the effectiveness of the intended message. In positing an essential meaning in the soundtrack, the instrumental model at the same time guarantees that the meaning remains intact, even after a substantial portion of the soundtrack is omitted from the subtitles. The intended message is immediately available for reproduction. The quantitative reduction involves no interpretation which can vary the message. I'm going to argue not only that this prevalent account of subtitling is misguided, but that it lacks the theoretical sophistication that would enable it to submit to a searching critique, that would enable it to submit to a searching critique its own thinking, as well as the translation practices to which it gives rise. Consequently, it produces sheer mystification instead of illuminating subtitles in a way that is comprehensive and incisive. The main problem is the instrumentalism on which the count rests. This model of translation must be abandoned if the study and practice of subtitling is to advance. The inadequacy of accounts, such as those offered by Gottlieb and Pedersen, becomes evident in any close examination of a subtitle where a condensation or reduction occurs. Uh, I'm going to take an example now. In Alfred Hitchcock's film, just to give you a, the context, and I'll show a clip. In Alfred Hitchcock's film, Psycho, from 1960, the, the main character, a secretary named Marion Crane, buys a used car to make her getaway after stealing $40,000 from her employer. Just after she enters the car lot, she buys and leaves through a newspaper so that she fails to notice that a policeman who had previously questioned her parks his patrol car across the street to observe her movements. Since she's on the run, the sequence of shots creates suspense in the narrative, especially in conjunction with Bernard Herrmann's atmospheric score, a series of modulated crescendos. As Crane rushes to close the deal with the snide car salesman, a point of view shot of the policeman watching her insinuates her fear of being arrested, visible in her facial expression. It is during this point of view shot that the salesman remarks off screen. One thing people never ought to be when they're buying used cars and that's in a hurry. So let me show you the clip. So that's Marion Crane, of course. 
for trouble. What? It's an old saying, the first customer of the day is always the most trouble. But like I say, I'm in no mood for it, so I'm going to treat you so fair and square that you won't have one human reason to give me. Can I trade my car in and take another? Do anything you've a mind to. In a woman, you will. Is that yours? Yes, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. I just... Sick of the sight of it. Well, why don't you have a look around here and see if there's something to strike your eyes. Meanwhile, I'll have my mechanic give you the once over. You want some coffee? I was just about... No, thank you. I'm in a hurry, and I just want to make a change. One thing people never ought to be when they're buying used cars, and that's in a hurry. But like I said, it's too nice a day to argue. I'll uh, shoot your car in the garage here. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Here's my transcription of the line on the soundtrack, okay? And I want to consider a couple of subtitles. As you can see, Italian and French. In the Italian and French versions, the word count of the English was reduced to fit within the conventional space constraints, and each line of the subtitles varies between 28 and 39 keystrokes. In square brackets, I've put in the number of keystrokes, as you could see there. The Italian and French translators have rearranged the clauses, bringing the syntax of the subtitles into conformity with the standard dialect of their languages. I'll just go back to the English once so you can get a, another look. In both cases, the rearrangement of the clauses was apparently designed to enhance readability by applying the principle that, I'm quoting here from a translation scholar, the simpler and more commonly used the syntactic structure of a subtitle, the least effort needed to decipher its meaning. The subtitles facilitate comprehension and increase reading speed then. Yeah, such a purely functional explanation assumes a fairly mechanical adherence to current subtitling conventions, so that it remains superficial in its understanding of textual effects. A more significant question would address how the translator's decisions affect the nature of the dialogue, its linguistic and rhetorical dimensions, its role in constructing point of view and characterization, its development of theme. What interpretation, I want to ask, does the translator's verbal choices inscribe in the film to the exclusion of other interpretive possibilities. The Italian and French subtitles clearly maintain a semantic correspondence according to dictionary definitions for several key words in the English line. Yet, more can be said about their lexical and syntactical features and their influence on tone and characterization. They are cast in the current standard dialects of Italian and French, and even resort to impersonal constructions. Non si dovrebbe mai in the Italian, one should never, or in the French, on ne devrait pas, one should not. The tone, as a result, is somewhat formal, so that in the Italian and French versions, the salesman appears to be politely helpful in providing his customer with advice. The English line, however, can support another very different interpretation. I'll go back. The salesman's language is markedly colloquial. Colloquial in pronunciation, the dropping of the G and buying and the contractions of what to, they are, and that is. Colloquial in lexicon, the generalized use of people, and in syntax. The omission of the connective word that in the construction one thing people and the anakulothan where the sentence undergoes a syntactical shift at the word and. <laughs> 
the register of the English is much lower than that of the Italian and French. And as a result, the salesman comes off as fast talking and sarcastic, even suspicious of Marion Crean's attempt to rush the deal. An Italian or French subtitle could conceivably inscribe this interpretation and still fit within the conventional space constraints by varying the use of the standard dialect with colloquialisms or more conversational forms, such as an address that is direct, even if polite. Lei non devrebbe mai, in Italian. Vous ne devriez pas, excuse my French. To be perfectly clear, I am not arguing that my reading of the salesman's line is right, nor that the colloquialized or conversational subtitles I have suggested as possibilities are correct or accurate. Your agreement with my reading or with the idea of devising a colloquialized or conversational subtitle does not make them right or accurate. It just means that I've been persuasive an effect at this point in my argument that is primarily rhetorical. The fact is that the English line can support at least two, possibly three interpretations that strain logic if they aren't mutually exclusive. The salesman as politely helpful or as sarcastically suspicious or both. And each interpretation leads to a particular translation that implements certain verbal choices, but not others. The viewer's decision as to how the salesman's line should be interpreted can ensure a corroborating interpretation of the audio-visual image of the actor's voice and body language, or vice versa. The viewer's interpretation of the image can ensure the selection of a particular interpretation of the line. The soundtrack, in other words, is not available in some unmediated form or in a form that is free of the nuances introduced by the visual image. Any comment on the soundtrack, therefore, is already an interpretation that works to synthesize audiovisual elements. Even my back translations of the Italian and French subtitles into English, these should be seen as interpretations insofar as the English versions fix a meaning by highlighting the impersonal constructions in the languages. No interpretation, furthermore, can be privileged merely on the strength of a comparison to the soundtrack, because the interpretation would need to establish a basis or criterion for that comparison by fixing the form, meaning, or effect of specific speech acts, as well as visual images. A colloquialized or conversational subtitle in Italian or French, then, cannot be taken as necessarily more adequate, more adequate to the English line. It would inevitably manifest a ratio of loss and gain, just like the version in the current standard dialect, even if the specific losses and gains would be different, involving different lexical and syntactical items in Italian or French, establishing a different network of intertextual and through discursive connect connections for Italian and French viewers, and soliciting a different mode of reception from the one that greeted the soundtrack in Anglophone cultures. For every translation radically decontextualizes the source text, dismantling, rearranging, and displacing its constitutive features while simultaneously recontextualizing it in another language and culture. The instrumental model of translation that underlies so much subtitling research and practice fails to consider these factors. And so it cannot analyze the connections between verbal choices and interpretive moves. In fact, it does not even recognize the existence of such connections where the range of interpretive possibilities open to subtitlers. To enable such an account, we need to adopt a hermeneutic model in which translation is seen as an interpretive act that varies the form, meaning, and effect of the source material according to the conditions, linguistic, cultural, and social, that the translator selects to frame the interpretation. These conditions, 
which come from both the source and receiving cultures are interpretants that mediate between the source material and the translation. Interpretants can be formal, such as a concept of equivalence or a particular style linked to a genre or discourse. Interpretants can also be thematic, such as an interpretation formulated independently elsewhere uh, in commentary or a particular ideology, a set of values, beliefs, and representations affiliated with a social group and serving the interest of that group. Only a hermeneutic model of translation, as I am too rapidly sketching it here, a model that stems from but significantly revises the German and French traditions of hermeneutics, only this model can expose the manifold conditions of any translation and avoid the mystification entailed by instrumentalism. It takes for granted that translation is transformation, even when a semantic correspondence is strictly maintained and it seeks to take responsibility for that transformation, not only by providing a transparent account of the interpretation inscribed in the source material, but by considering the impact of the inscription in the social situations where the translation is produced and received. The advance made possible by the hermeneutic model becomes more evident if we use it to examine the problems posed by translating culture-specific items or in Pedersen's terms, this is extra linguistic cultural references. That's the term he uses. He provides an example from Larry Gelbart and Jean Reynolds television series, MASH, which was not only long running in the United States in 1972 and 1983, but it was widely, maybe still is, widely viewed abroad. In one episode, The deranged intelligence officer, Colonel Sam Flagg, explains how he taught himself not to laugh or smile. So here's the line on the soundtrack. I watched a hundred, hundred hours of the Three Stooges. Every time I felt like smiling, I jabbed myself in the stomach with a cattle prod. The Danish subtitler replaced the allusion to the Three Stooges with another cultural reference, as you can see it there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Pedersen provides the translation into English here. He observes that some Danish viewers might notice the discrepancy between the English line on the soundtrack and the Danish subtitle, although he limits their possible responses to the snap judgment that the translation is erroneous. He argues, however, that the choice is not an error, but a highly felicitous solution, that's his phrase, that is actually equivalent to the English. This is what he says. The subtitler has sought equivalence of effect rather than equivalence of information. Pedersen cites Eugene Nida's notion of dynamic equivalence, which is, which is based on what Nida calls the principle of equivalent effect. Here's the passage from Nida. So I'll read it out. Nida explains that in such a translation, one is not so concerned with matching the receptor language message with the source language message, but with the dynamic relationship, that the relationship between receptor and message should be substantially the same as that which existed between the original receptors and the message. Patterson, like Nida before him, is assuming the instrumental model. The equivalent effect is an invariant caused by the source text. In this case, the comical effect of the dialogue from the episode of MASH. And the subtitler reproduces or transfers that effect without change, regardless of the fact that Laurel and Hardy have been substituted for the Three Stooges. That some, and regardless of the fact that some segments of the Danish audience may understand English and detect the discrepancy. And regardless of the fact that the different audience segments, whether in Denmark or in Anglophone countries, are likely to have different responses to the two comedy teams. These qualifications show 
beyond a doubt that the notion of equivalent effect is a naive fiction. No translation can elicit a response from its reader that is the same or even similar to the response elicited from the source language reader by the source text. In reality, the notion of equivalent effect involves an aggressive act of interpretation that has generally gone unexamined. It reduces the source material and its translation to a shared meaning that strips away any formal and thematic differences. And it performs this semantic reduction on the basis of an instrumental model in which the meaning is assumed to be invariant, free of the variations that always occur among different cultural constituencies in the same or different historical moments. In the example from the Danish version of MASH, this shared meaning might be phrased as a slapstick comedy routine, or more precisely, broad humor in the form of physical comedy. Hence, Pedersen's instrumentalism excludes other interpretive possibilities. For the fact remains that the Three Stooges were not Laurel and Hardy, and these two comedy routine teams performed different routines and received different responses from their audiences. In the United States, both achieved popularity, but the Three Stooges were long marginalized in film studies because their brand of slapstick humor was considered lowbrow, too vulgar to be taken seriously, whereas Laurel and Hardy were seen as sophisticated and made the object of scholarly attention at least as early as the 1960s. Laurel and Hardy were also very popular in Scandinavia, so much so that their names were assigned a specific translation in Scandinavian languages. And not only were their films distributed in the region, but in the 1940s, they toured there with their act. The Three Stooges films, as Pedersen puts it, never made it to Scandinavia. The change in cultural reference is not simply a difference between unintelligibility and an intelligible joke, just to be clear. It also affects the characterization of Colonel Flagg, who in English is more buffoonish, but in Danish is more endearing, even more cultured in his appreciation of classic film comedy, depending on the audience segment who views the subtitled episode on their familiarity with Anglophone film traditions and genres. Pedersen's notion that cultural references in the soundtrack are extra-linguistic must be seen as a questionable reification forced by his instrumentalism. References never exist outside of some form of representation or semiosis, outside of some medium, and they come to a cultural form and practice laden with meanings, values, and functions that have accrued from their circulation in a culture through different media, print and electronic, linguistic and audiovisual. It is only the reification produced by an essentialist concept of language that would attach the references from the changing media and cultural context in which they are invested with significance. One might think that subtitlers adept at dealing with such translation problems would develop an intuitive sense of the hermeneutic model and come to regard their work as fundamentally an interpretive act that inevitably transforms the source material. But this doesn't seem to have happened much. Regardless of whether they learned subtitling on the job or studied it in a translator training program, their rare accounts of their work remain not only unreflective, but uncritical showing an unwillingness to question dominant subtitling conventions. A pertinent example is offered by Henri Bayard, a noted French subtitler who also produces and directs programs for French radio and television. Since 1983, Bayard has subtitled over 100 French and English films. In an essay included in Adam Egoyan and Ian Balfour's edited volume, Subtitles from 2004, Bayard discusses, discusses, I'm sorry, discusses his sub English subtitles for Alain Cavalier's film from 1986, Therese. This is what Henri Bayard says, okay? 
I'll read it out for you. The young nun who was to become Saint Therese de Lisieux had an unfettered juvenile passion for Christ, and her beefs with Jesus had the flavor of a lover's quarrel. I decided, with Cavalier's consent, to keep all references to Christ in the lower case. He, lowercase, instead of he, and so forth. Thine, lowercase, instead of thine. Uh, one American critic who saw the film in an advanced preview thought the director was showing, quoting here, right, showing disrespect and reduced the whole dialogue between Therese and Jesus to a lover's tiff. Bayard's verbal choices clearly assume a hermeneutic model. He deliberately applied two formal interpretants a semantic correspondence to the French dialogue, and an English style that is grounded on a thematic interpretant, which is his own interpretation of the film. His interpretation of Teresa's dialogues with Christ as comparable to a lover's quarrel led him not only to use the lower case in the subtitles for those key words, but to mix current standard English with an early modern form of English, like thine, redolent of the King James Bible. The American critics' disapproval of Bayard's choices, in contrast, is based on the prevalent instrumentalism. The critic assumes that the director, Cavalier, deposited a semantic invariant in the screenplay, a lover's tiff, which was signified in the actor's speech on the soundtrack and it was subsequently reproduced in the subtitles in an unbroken chain of signification. In this instrumentalist account, the subtitler's crucial intervention is rendered invisible. Bayard could, of course, have used conventional punctuation, uppercase for sacred figures, as well as current standard English. Here, too, the subtitler's interpretive labor would have been invisible to the critic, but only because the subtitler would have applied the interpretants that the critic finds most satisfactory in representing a young woman's address to Christ. In other words, strict adherence to linguistic norms. The critic's instrumentalism masks rather than discloses his own interpretive act in which religious representation is made to answer to a concept of stylistic decorum so as to produce a specific variety of the realist illusion, a specific notion of what can stand for reality in a film biography of a saint. What leads film viewers, including critics, to adopt an instrumental model of translation in their response to subtitles? More often than not, viewers are likely to assume this model with every kind of translation they encounter. But in the case of film, we must figure in their deep investment in the representational conventions of the medium. The combination of continuity editing, spatiotemporal coherence, narrative causality, and synchronous sound, which creates the diegesis, the fictional world, in other words, the fictional world where the characters enact the plot. The construction of this illusory reality is supported by subtitles that provide basic narrative information through condensation, reformulation, and omission, among other conventional strategies of manipulating the speech on the soundtrack. In the viewer's response, the subtitles are effectively subsumed into the diegesis, whereas they are by definition non-diegetic elements comparable to credits or music, which are added to the narrative. This response rests on the assumption that the subtitles reproduce a semantic invariant contained in the character's dialogue. It is usually supported by specific linguistic features. Because the language of translation throughout the world today tends to be extremely homogeneous, regardless of the genre or text type or media, because it adheres mostly to the current standard dialect and therefore the most familiar and accessible form of the translating language, subtitles written in this language can easily produce the illusion of transparency, giving the impression 
that they communicate the speech and the soundtrack directly in an untroubled fashion, while reinforcing the realism of the film through their unobtrusiveness. This discursive regime of transparent translation, along with the representational conventions of, of film, has fostered the expectation that the subtitler should be invisible. Bayard's departures from current standard English frustrate that expectation, however, and call attention to themselves, as the American critic's response makes clear. Bayard's subtitles prove to be so subversive of conventional practices that when the English version of Cavalier's film was released, whether as a 35 millimeter print or on VH, uh, VHS and uh, DVD, the subtitles were revised by another translator, someone called Matthew Pollock, without Bayard's permission or even his knowledge. So that both Bayard and Pollock are credited on these other versions. As a result, a version of the film with Bayard's original subtitles is virtually impossible to find. His essay presents the only evidence for his translation strategies. Since Bayard did not retain a copy of his subtitles, furthermore, the nature and extent of Pollock's revisions cannot be determined with any exactness. Colloquialisms seem to have been retained, but any archaisms were replaced by standard usage. Yet, the most troubling aspect of this case is the lack of comprehension and critical self-awareness that is displayed not so much in the critics' comment as in Bayard's. Despite the inventiveness of his subtitling, Bayard seems to be unable to grasp its theoretical and practical implications. Immediately after describing his work on Cavalier's film, he asserts that subtitling is a form of cultural ventriloquism and the focus must remain on the puppet, not the puppeteer. Our task as subtitlers is to create subliminal subtitles so in sync with the mood and rhythm of the movie that the audience isn't even aware it is reading. We want not to be noticed. They are subtitling really points in a very different direction. It encourages in the audience not a subliminal response, unconscious of his intervention, but an active engagement with the subtitles as text in their own right relatively autonomous from the soundtrack, insofar as they were created by a translator in a different language for a different culture on the basis of a rather specific interpretation of the source material. In Bayard's view, however, the ideal subtitles are so in sync with the mood and rhythm of the movie as to be invisible. Thus, he supports the collusion between the translation and the diegesis and implicitly regards his interpretation of the film as true or right, overlooking the possibility that Cavalier's representation of Therese's life might be interpreted in varying ways. Bayard's translation practice shows him performing an interpretive act, but his commentary on his practice is resolutely instrumentalist. The key problem posed by this case, then, is not that viewers are forced to become aware of subtitles like Bayard's, but rather that viewers don't know how to understand or process them. If viewers assume a hermeneutic model of translation, resisting the complete subsumption of the subtitles into the diegesis, they can perceive Bayard's verbal choices as based on, but distinct from, the audiovisual images in the French film, constituting an interpretation in English because non-standard items like colloquialisms and archaisms, not only deviate from conventional subtitling practices, but also derive from a particular moment in the history of the English language. Understood in this way, the subtitles need not provoke an unpleasurable experience when the viewer becomes aware of them. On the contrary, they can enhance the viewer's appreciation of the film, whether or not that viewer understands the language spoken on the soundtrack. Another example can serve to demonstrate and develop this point a little further. It involves a pun 
which because puns depend on sound, uh, a pun is usually doomed to be omitted in the translation process, since the acoustic features of language are the first to be affected. Unless, of course, the translator is so resourceful that he or she manages to devise a comparable pun in the translating language. In this case, what needs to be considered is the semantic gain of the pun, the additional meanings by which the translation inscribes an interpretation of the film. So the pun I want to consider occurs near the beginning of Woody Allen's film, uh, Annie Hall from 1977. So I'm going to show you a clip of this. So um, the clip will begin here. Um, Woody Allen and his friend Rob are all the way at the back uh, of the frame here. Uh, Woody Allen is playing a character named Alvy Singer. And in this scene, Alvy manifests his paranoia about anti-Semitism in a conversation, uh, again, with his friend, Rob. I distinctly heard it. He muttered under his breath, Jew. No, I'm not. We were walking off the tennis court, and, you know, he was there, and me and his wife, and he looked at her, and then they both looked at me, and under his breath, he said, Jew. <laughs> Holly, you're a total paranoid. Well, how am I a paranoid? I pick up on those kind of things. You know, I was having lunch with some guys from NBC, so I said, uh, did you eat yet, or what? And Tom Christie said, no, Jew? Not did you. Jew eat? Jew? No, not did you eat, but Jew eat? Jew? You get it? Jew eat? Uh, Max. You, uh, Stop calling me Max. Why, Max? It's a good name for you. Max, you see conspiracies and everything. No, I don't. You know, I was in a record store. Listen to this. So I know there's this big, tall, blonde, crew-cutted guy, and he's looking at me in a funny way and smiling, and he's saying, yes, we have a sale this week on Wagner. Wagner, Max. Wagner. So I know what he's really trying to tell me, very significantly, Wagner. All right, Max. Okay. Uh, Woody Allen. I just... Let, let me go back. Um, here's the English, so you can have a look at that. <clears throat> and let me, let me make some comments. <clears throat> so you can see it, um, the, the pun comes up in the last bit there, okay? So it, it's the play on did you and the word Jew, okay? So the, the play on did you and Jew is impossible to recreate in other languages because it turns on a particular pronunciation of the English phrase, did you, okay? Obvious point, but let's make everything clear here. The subtitles on the DVD version of the film make a, the French subtitles make a strained effort to recreate the pun, and it does it, here it is, okay? By introducing the irrelevant notion of tiredness. Okay, as you could see it there, je suis fatigué, right, uh, where I am tired. So as to create an occasion to mimic the sound of juif, the French word for Jew. Um, as Alvi explains it to Rob, what Tom Christie says in the cafeteria is this in the French subtitles. Okay. Uh, and that's my um, back translation. The Spanish subtitles um, make no effort of any kind to imitate the pun. Okay, I'm sorry, you, you can see at the bottom there, the second half of the, of the frame in the PowerPoint is the um, uh, Spanish the subtitles. So there, Alvi reports Tom Christie's response to his question as a blunt insult. Christie says simply, no, e tu judio? Uh, no, and, and you, Jew? Okay, so here's the point. The French and Spanish subtitles can be taken either as substantiating Alvi's concern about racist remarks or as so ridiculously extreme as to be untrue. Uh, amounting to an absurd exaggeration and therefore serving as evidence of his paranoia. Jose Luis Guarnier, uh, the Catalan film critic who published a Spanish translation of the screenplay in 
1981, created a brilliant pun in Spanish to, re to replace the English word. And here is his Spanish version, okay? So he recreated <clears throat> or created a, a new pun. Uh, and again, it's, it's in the bottom section. Uh, you can see it there. This is actually a very close uh, translation. Uh, it's the word hudias, hudias, okay? So the word hudias perfectly fits the context. The lunchtime conversation between Alvi and Tom Christie because it signifies a food in Peninsular Spanish, green beans. Yet because the word can also signify Jewish women, a meaning activated by the topic of Alvi's conversation with Rob, by the context, in other words, it maintains the racist innuendo that Alvi detects. Nonetheless, Guarnet's interpretation, although supported by the English dialogue, introduces a difference that transforms the characterization of Alvi. In the English, Alvi is truly paranoid in that he hears the word Jew when it is not in fact uttered. Whereas in the Spanish, Tom Christie uses a word that refers to Jews and can be taken as an anti-Semitic slur, possibly a double entendre, but in any case, a reference that justifies Alvi's suspicion and suggests that he is not as paranoid as he may seem. The Spanish pun puts these meanings into play, but does not decide among them. Although for the most part, Spain handles audiovisual translation through dubbing, uh, Guarnet's published version can conceivably be incorporated into a subtitle. A viewer who assumes the instrumental model of translation will merely respond to the Spanish pun as a reproduction of the English dialogue and laugh. A viewer who assumes the instrumental model will laugh too, but this viewer is likely to recognize the subtitler's hand. This recognition is based on the awareness that the pun is specific to the Spanish of Spain, not Latin America, and that it can work only in Spanish if it imitates some verbal effect in the English dialogue. A more reflective viewer might take another step to interpret the subtitler's interpretation. Perceiving how the Spanish pun alters Alvi's characterization from a paranoid schlemiel to the schlemiel who actually suffers an anti-Semitic slur, however comical it may seem. The reflective viewer who can understand English, but who is also inclined towards suspicious responses might take a further step to discern that Guarnet's pun interrogates Allen's screenplay, exposing the fact that the English treats anti-Semitism as a form of paranoia that can become the basis of jokes, even as the English comes back to worry the equivalence of the Spanish version and to point up the pressure to represent an instance of persecution which is perhaps not surprising in a translation published within a decade after the end of Franco's fascist dictatorship. The subtitle, in other words, like any translation, can be seen as setting up a critical dialectic with the source material, whereby they submit one another to a probing critique, although only when approached with the hermeneutics of suspicion, as Paul Ricoeur called it, discounting the seemingly coherent surface of a text so as to probe for latent meanings through omissions, additions, or discrepancies. The trouble with subtitles, then, is a matter of interpretation. In all the senses that I have tried to construe interpretation in this paper. For too long, it feels like forever, subtitles have been constrained by sheer lack of imagination on the part of both subtitlers and their audiences. 
because an instrumental model continues to dominate thinking about translation. Isn't it time that we acknowledge instrumentalism to be a hoax, born out of the fear that translation contaminates and falsifies when it ought to reproduce or transfer a source invariant? Translation can definitely give us a semantic correspondence. It can even give us an analog for the style of the source text, but it doesn't give either without the variation that an interpretation always introduces. Novels and poems, plays and films, philosophical treatises and ethnographies, sacred texts and histories are all translated today. But these humanistic genres and text types are complex cultural artifacts that are much more than a semantic correspondence and a stylistic analog. A translation can never give back the source text intact. It is a cultural artifact with its own constitutive materials and its own ways of processing them, with its own cultural and social effects and its own historical significance. That's something we should study and practice. And yes, learn how to enjoy. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Benuti, for a fascinating talk. Uh, let me just share my screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so um, I'll go straight to the to the questions that seem to be uh, coming forward. Um, I've got actually a few on my email as well, but let's just read the 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 first one. So the first one says, "I'm curious to what extent can subtitles created in 1960 cycle be described as typical of current subtitling conventions?" Wouldn't contemporary examples from Netflix, et cetera, be more authentic or current? They are definitely more fluid, register appropriate, but perhaps you will get to these. Great question. <laughs> Thank you, Chris Durbin. Um, one of the things I, I've been doing is looking at new subtitles that have been um, uh, created for older films. And it's something that can be done, um, um, especially if you're uh, obsessive about research projects, because um, the Criterion Collection um, has been uh, remastering films and uh, getting uh, subtitlers to redo the subtitles. So it's possible to look at different sets of subtitles uh, over time. And um, that enables us, I think, to do a kind of history uh, of subtitling and to get a sense of how uh, subtitling uh, strategies um, you know, harden into conventional um, strategies and ch also change. Um, and, and I would definitely agree that um, the subtitles that are coming up um, in Netflix, um, in some programs uh, in any case, um, do show uh, changes. Um, you can see them, uh, for instance, uh, I, I guess the most noticeable way, uh, especially uh, with English, is the way um, um, you know, non-standard forms uh, are being used. Um, and I'm thinking particularly of um, uh, obscenities. Uh, so I, I, I do watch uh, a lot of television, especially uh, under the pandemic. And uh, one of the things that struck me is that, you know, uh, for instance, in the, um, the Polish uh, adaptation um, of um, uh, The Woods, the Harlan Coben um, uh, novel, um, th those subtitles seem, you know, much more open um, to linguistic variation. And uh, I think that's one sign that, um, you know, subtitles are changing. So, um, so let's leave it like that. <laughs>
Can I come in with an question which has come up um, from Chihua Bu? Um, Professor Venuti, may I ask if you would agree that the application of ethnographic approaches could help you get even more fruitful and scientific results and assumptions? Um, given my paper, um, just, just to stick with that, you know, I, I would have to say uh, yes, but um, it comes up in my paper um, you know, by thinking out the interpretive possibilities of uh, particular you know, verbal choices made by translators. Um, in other words, I, I, I wanna consider verbal choices, first of all, uh, as interpretive moves. Uh, I, I wanna really move away from the way translations are typically discussed, um, where the unit of translation tends to be uh, fixed on the word. Um, whereas, uh, as, as any translator knows, there are many units uh, of translation. They range from the word to the phrase, to the sentence, to the paragraph, to the section, the chapter, to the entire text. And uh, what happens in translation is that translators, you know, zigzag between these uh, different units. And one of the things that happens, of course, is, is that um, how each unit is construed or interpreted uh, in a translation changes <laughs> throughout um, in you know, um, many, many ways. So I, I want to you know, move away from considering verbal choices and, and stopping there. Um, I, I want to consider always how specific verbal choices are interpretive moves in the sense of um, shaping, determining larger textual structures. So that if, if we look at translations uh, of a novel, um, verbal choices affect things like, you know, narrative point of view. Uh, they affect dialogue and characterization. They, they could affect, you know, the shape of the narrative uh, ultimately. And that, that's where we need to go to understand more about the cultural and, and social impact uh, of translations. Um, this can be done, you know, in, in two ways, and, and we should definitely, you know, do both of those. One is to be open to the sense that um, there are interpretive possibilities, a whole range of them, that any source text can support multiple and um, conflicting interpretations, and, and therefore multiple and conflicting translations. And whenever we look at, you know, translations, retranslations in time, you know, this, this becomes apparent. Um, but seeing how audiences, specific readers, specific, you know, viewers, um, you know, react to translations and ethnography of viewing and reading experiences um, is also, uh, I think, uh, important. However, that kind of uh, study uh, will only be valuable to the extent that the receivers, the readers or viewers can articulate their responses with some degree of critical self-awareness or sophistication. Um, and where we are uh, right now, I think, in translation, in thinking about translation and receiving translation, is, is that we, we haven't achieved that kind of sophistication, generally speaking, um, because many, many users of translations, many students of translations, um, still look at translation on the basis of what I'm calling an instrumental model. Um, the translation, you know, people still want to think, can and should reproduce or transfer an invariant contained in or caused by the source text, an invariant form, like a style, uh, an invariant meaning, but, or an invariant effect, you know, Eugene Nida, the equivalence of effect. But, you know, translation can't do that. I'd like to suggest. If you, if you want that, 
you're not going to get it. Even if you learn the source language and immerse yourself in the source culture, even in the source culture, the source text can support multiple and conflicting interpretations. So, you know, welcome to the real world is, with, you know, is what I want to say. Um, although, I'm taking a step back now, um, I want to suggest that my own insistence on a hermeneutic approach to translation, my insistence on looking at translation as an interpretive act, as a way to in, advance thinking about translation, receiving translations, that itself is an interpretive act, okay? And in giving my paper, I'm looking to build a consensus. I want you to start looking at translations with me in this way and to teach me the way you look at them as interpretive acts as well. Um, what is waiting for us on the other side of a hermeneutic model of translation? I'm, I'm unable to think that right this minute, uh, even after several cups of coffee. So um, that's to come. That is a not yet in translation studies. So uh, that's a long answer to the question of ethnography. So um, yes, but I think we have to keep in mind that, you know, um, readers of translations, users of translations want to trust the translation and their notions of trust are often instrumentalist. Um, they want to trust that the translation reproduces the source text and that will limit, you know, the critical self-awareness that I think we need um, in order for, you know, translation to be, to advance and, and to be less marginalized in cultures around the world. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Larry. So it's the question in the chat box that says, what do you think about domestication and subtitling? Um, well, I think that domestication and subtitling, you know, has been the rule insofar as um, uh, subtitlers, um, you know, whether they're trained or not, that the conventions, in other words, uh, of subtitling, but it's, it's, it's reproduced, um, you know, by our colleagues in, in translation studies, when there's an insistence on, you know, for instance, adhering to the current standard dialect of the translating language, okay? I mean, that very choice is, it turns out to be a domesticating move because um, it, it makes the subtitles um, unobtrusive and the whole mechanism of the subtitle, uh, what I was describing as a subsumption into the diegesis, uh, the subtitles, you know, essentially become invisible in the, in the viewing experience, whereas they are an addition, okay? Something else is going on in the subtitles. And when you can understand, you know, the, the film soundtrack, the, the subtitles, you know, give you something else that's interesting. I don't, I don't want to dismiss what it's giving. It's, it's giving us another interpretation. Uh, that may conform to, reinforce, run counter to, you know, the audiovisual image. Um, so, but um, uh, the literature on, on subtitling, as well as subtitling practices, for a very long time, um, you know, has, has been domesticating, you know, in that sense. Um, so, um, uh, it's not surprising that I would advocate a kind of subtitling that moves away from the current standard dialect and that is more adventurous uh, in its interpretations. Um, and um, as the you know, first question that I was asked you know, suggests, especially with vehicles like Netflix or the Criterion Collection, um, they seem to be moving in that direction. So, um, if we're in the position of training subtitlers, I mean, we need to teach them also how to interpret, not simply to mechanically translate, you know, the, 
um, what's on the soundtrack. Um, we also, I think, need to give them uh, a sense, you know, as I've been insisting on the relationship between verbal choices and interpretive moves. I mean, Jan Pedersen was my example. Um, I, I don't want to suggest that the translator who picked um, Laurel and Hardy, the, the Scandinavian, the Danish translation of, of uh, Laurel and Hardy, for and use that to replace, you know, the Three Stooges. I, I don't want to suggest that is a wrong translation. Um, you know, there. What I do want to suggest is that it releases interpretive possibilities that we need to think about. It changes the characterization of the character who speaks it or whose speech is being translated in that subtitle. And that, that's where we should go in the first instance um, to decide whether it's a valuable translation uh, is another question. I mean, we need first to get a sense of, of, of what its impact is. Um, it could be argued, I mean, depending on how familiar Laurel and Hardy continues to be in, in Danish culture, uh, it, it could be a domesticating act. Um, and there may be other comedy teams in Danish culture that could be used uh, in order to suggest a different interpretation that is less familiar and therefore, you know, less domesticating. It insinuates a, a cultural difference. So um, I think it's most important that we become aware that a range of interpretive possibilities exist. Uh, if anything, what the Hermannic model does, I mean, thinking of translation as an interpretive act, is to make us aware that different possibilities exist, <laughs> okay? And that what is right or wrong, you can only make those kinds of judgments when you contextualize a verbal choice. Um, and there are different ways, of course, to develop context of interpretation, so. Thank you. Um, can I come in with a question from our very own Christina Marinetti here uh, in yeah. uh, Emlang? She asks, what are the implications of a hermeneutic approach to subtitling in terms of the visibility, invisibility of the subtitlers themselves? And could the type of playful, creative, interventionist approach one finds in fun subtitlers work? provide a useful starting point for thinking about this? Uh, yes, Christina. <laughs> uh, to start with the second question, it already has. Um, I mean, fan subbing has been uh, one of the remarkable things I think about the, the work uh, as it's developed, the research uh, on subtitles within translation studies is that a tremendous amount of attention has been paid to fan subbing because that is where, you know, translators are really visible. You know, I mean, you get fans subtitling their favorite programs, you get multiple versions uh, of that. Um, then, you know, fan subbing, um, you know, has a kind of, you know, political dimension. It's used in activist kinds of uh, situations. So I, I think that, um, you know, fan subbing is, you know, it's definitely a place where subtitlers are, you know, very visible. Um, at the same time, I, I have to say that um, this is a special kind uh, of translation that not everyone is aware. People who watch, you know, foreign films may not even be aware that fan subbing exists for films and, and television programs. And, um, what, what I really want to see, I mean, this is my hope, uh, however utopian uh, it may seem, uh, is to see new developments, new risks being taken by subtitlers of feature films. This has been the slowest form of subtitling to change. Um, we see it changing now uh, as, uh, you know, television production uh, has really expanded uh, exponentially. Uh, so that you have, um, you know, services like Netflix producing their own, you know, films and television programs, and that has opened up, you know, home box office and, and so forth. That that has opened up, um, you know, a, a lot of uh, experimentation uh, among subtitlers. Uh, 
Um, but you know, one of the problems you know that I experience uh, in Anglophone cultures uh, in the U.S. You know, I, I live in New York City, and um, you know what has happened. You know, in 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 my lifetime, is that there are fewer and fewer opportunities to see foreign films, um, and, and that is happening because um, viewers don't want to go to a movie theater and see a subtitled film. <laughs> okay, um, so this is the feature film market, in other words, and um, uh, it's definitely a question of, of visibility. But it, but at the same time, you know, viewers. To go back to to an earlier point, viewers need to be, you know, instructed. I hate to put it in those terms. Why should I hate it? I mean, people need to be taught about translation. Uh, that's what our work is, and uh, I think you know different ways of appreciating translation need to be very high, you know, uh, on our agendas. How to read translations as translations. Uh, so that the whole stigma attached to translations, especially to subtitles, is, is removed. And we can begin to appreciate, you know, what a subtitle can offer us, uh, a whole interpretation built into the audiovisual experience, really unique. Thank you, Larry. So another question from Chris Durbin in the Q&A uh, box. So he says, I'm following the arguments, but find the generalization old. Um, if you claim they relate to subtitling practices today. So the examples are um, 15, 20, 30 years old. So many produced when subtitlers were still working on paper with far less control on time, codes, images, etc. So how would you characterize the subtitling approach in, say, uh, Michael, Moore, Michael Moore's films? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't studied them. But... Um, uh, as, as I mentioned, you know, subtitling conventions are changing. So I, I really think, you know, I answered that question. Um, as, as someone who watches film and television every day, where I have been <laughs> during the pandemic, especially every day I've been watching something, um, it strikes me that in some areas, subtitling uh, strategies are really becoming, you know, experimental and, and opening up. Uh, and in others, you know, they're, they're pretty conventional. So, um, you know, whether we take, um, you know, Woody Allen on DVD or, um, you know, what's been done with, you know, Hitchcock Psycho, where we look at what's happening today, I think you're going to find what I would call an uneven development. Um, and, you know, I mean, that's, that's the way things normally work. Um, so uh, how viewers respond, you know, to the uneven developments, you know, would be interesting uh, to, to think about and, and, you know, to gather information about, um, to see if the uneven development possibly is provoking, you know, avid viewers to, um, think about how they're, you know, understanding the function of subtitles. Um, I would want to hope that, but um, it's not clear at this point. So. If I can come in with a question from the chat um, from Akkad al Hussein. To what extent should the translator draw attention to him or herself through his or her unique interpretive verbal choices? Where do you see the limits of this approach? And when would it be counterproductive or unethical to insist on the visibility of the translator or subtitler? Well, uh, to start with the last part, um, uh, the questions of ethics, you know, depend on concepts of ethics. And, um, you know, you would have to formulate a, a concept of ethics in order to use it to, to judge, you know, um, a translation. Uh, my concept of ethics, um, you know, derived from, you know, thinkers within translation studies like Antoine Berman um, and, you know, philosophers outside of translation studies like uh, Alain Badieu um, looks at the good, the good translation as the translation that does not 
allow for business as usual, <laughs> okay? That translation insofar as it traffics in difference should somehow challenge the hierarchy of values in the receiving culture. Um, it should not be business as usual. It should not confirm the current cultural conjuncture in the receiving situation. Um, <clears throat> now, there are risks to do this, certainly. Um, and there are risks that uh, also happen in, in every discipline. Um, the more radical the move is, the more it risks being restricted to a narrower audience and even to being neglected, marginalized, suppressed. Um, if a philosopher comes along and decides that we need, we have a, he has a new, or she has a new, or whoever has a new translation of a particular a canonical philosophical text, but this translation involves a new interpretation, an interpretation that challenges the interpretation currently dominant in the institution. Um, academic study of philosophy, for instance, um, that translation is going to encounter difficulties, difficulties of acceptance. Um, it will have to build a new consensus uh, of support for that interpretation. Um, this is what humanistic study is, uh, ultimately, but it's also the way, you know, uh, developments in the, variety, the arts and the human sciences work, generally speaking. So I, I'm interested in forms of translation, and I see them as primarily ethical. Forms of translation that challenge the status quo, um, as opposed to maintaining it. Thank you, Larry. Another question from the Q&A box from Hannah. So she says, I wonder how far we can lay the blame for a perceived lack of imagination in the examples you showed at the feet of subtitlers. I wonder whether we could take a moment to consider the other factors at play here, not only the conditions in which subtitlers are working, but also the numerous other agents involved in the process. I think that many of us would like to argue that subtitles shouldn't necessarily be invisible, but there are other expectations powers at play. Uh, exactly. Uh, I, I understand um, the question. Um, I, I'm not sure, um, you know, what's behind the question. The question, the, um, the person who's asking it may have a particular thing in mind, but what it suggests to me is that, you know, subtitlers have to work. They have to eat and live, and there is enormous pressure on subtitlers, as on translators, generally speaking, to conform to the standards um, of, you know, the agencies and institutions that commission them. Um, and the, the kind of struggle that I am trying to articulate here for translators and users of translation for translation uh, is one that where there are, you know, different fronts uh, in this struggle, in this battle. Um, and, you know, one way to look at it is that subtitlers, you know, in, in order to uh, create a space for the kind of practice that, um, you know, I, I'm envisioning here, um, they need to be very, very sophisticated in the way they articulate and justify their choices. Uh, they need to be able to talk to power. Um, to the power that commissions them. And that's something, you know, again, that's another area, I, I think, where translation, translation studies is at um, uh, a level that is not as advanced as, you know, we would like it to be, that many professional translators, um, uh, even very, very talented, very, very accomplished translators, um, are, are not always uh, able or even interested 
in um, you know just talking about their work in, in ways that illuminate it for their readers. Um, and I, I think that um, you know this is a problem. Um, you know, uh, some not too long ago, uh, I was um, gave a paper, uh, you know, to a, a translators association where I was advocating um, the necessity of you know translation theory of being able to think theoretically, uh, you know, about your work if you're a translator. Um, by that, of course, I meant you know developing a kind of you know what I'm calling a critical self awareness of self consciousness. Um, and, you know, I, I was booed by segments of this audience um, that there was a real antagonism um, expressed, you know, during and, and after my talk. Um, and it struck me as, you know, sadly, as a kind of anti-intellectualism that we really don't need. Um, I mean, when novelists, you know, who often, you know, do not talk about their work or poets, um, do not talk about their work, uh, that doesn't stop them from immersing themselves in the history of their art. Um, reading novels from different periods and, and, and developing a sense of what they are doing in relationship to a historical understanding uh, of it. The same thing, you know, with poets. Um, why shouldn't translators do that? <laughs> and given where translation uh, is, uh, in, in terms of, you know, the study of translation, translation research and so forth, there's a lot of material uh, out there uh, to think about. I do not want to suggest that translators are poets and novelists, even when they translate these forms, that translation is something else, it's something different. Um, but this would only make it more urgent I think for translators to become you know, conceptually self-aware, um, if only because their work is about you know, representing a foreign culture. Uh, it's about dealing with a foreign language for readers who do not have access to these things. So, okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Hilary Brown in the uh, question and answer section. Can you say more about the source text form, please? On page 174 of Contra Instrumentalism, you say, and I'm quoting you, stop assuming that a source text possesses an invariant form, meaning or effect, end of quotation. I understand the meaning and effect bit, but struggle with form. A sonnet is always a sonnet, surely. Um. <clears throat> Yes, but there's no reason why a sonnet should be translated into a sonnet. <laughs> That's one way to look at it. Um, another way is to um, take a specific case. Um, Andre Lefebvre, a very distinguished um, uh, you know, scholar of translation studies, as, as, we, as we know, uh, and someone who I admired and, and knew personally and, and regret that he's no longer with us, um, wrote a marvelous essay, which I read and, and teach uh, often um, about the translation of Brecht into English. And um, this is an essay where Andre, you know, lays out, um, you know, his key concepts of translation as refraction. Uh, he's arguing that translations should be given the same attention by literary historians and critics um, as, um, um, you know, original compositions, if we're going to learn things uh, about translation. And it's only romantic concepts of authorship that are, you know, stopping um, uh, scholars from doing this. This is an essay written in the early 80s. And yet when he goes and actually talks about the translations, he laments that they were translated in a way that, according to him, does not give us much of Brecht. Uh, and it strikes me that, you know, he suddenly shifts from um, what I would call, you know, a hermeneutic approach to translation to something that is very instrumentalist. Uh, and what he does is, is look at uh, the, the early translations of Brecht uh, 
uh, into English by uh, US uh, translators uh, who had assimilated Brecht's text to Broadway musicals. So here's a formal change, okay? Um, whatever form you, know, you want to assign to, to the German text uh, in this case, um, if you want to get into Brecht's you know, alienation effect as a, as a key factor or, or whatever, um, you know, we, we can agree you know, uh, on an interpretation uh, you know, of the form of, of Brecht's plays or a particular play. Uh, Andre was studying in this particular essay, uh, Mother Courage and Her Children. Um, the fact that it had been assimilated to the Broadway musical, um, I would consider, first of all, um, you know, a possible move. It's an interpretation that varies the form of the source text. Uh, in order to decide the value of, the, of that interpretation, we would have to consider you know, things like cultural impact. Uh, we would have to consider the history of English translations of German drama uh, or of you know, uh, modernist German drama, or however you want to do that. We would need to consider um, conventions in the translation of other forms, not German, but other languages, uh, drama from other languages, um, as well as the history of translation strategies. Um, we would have to get a sense of, you know, what the impact was of translating Brecht in this way. And, and just to keep the debate alive, um, I, I would think that the Broadway musical, <laughs> that form brings with it um, a, a certain semantic and ideological burden that is not necessarily and most likely not at all consistent with Brecht's, you know, form and theme. Uh, as a result, <laughs> I, I think one of the ways to look at that, just one, there are a variety of ways, but one is that the Broadway musical was showing things about Brecht that would not have been apparent just reading the German text. And Brecht, meanwhile, was doing things to the Broadway musical, was making it say things that it had not said before, uh, so that the experience of, of seeing these plays produced on the Broadway stage um, could have been, you know, really, really climactic, potentially, depending on the viewer. So, um, again, you know, uh, sonnets are often not translated as sonnets. Rhyme schemes are not, you know, maintained. Uh, it's hard to maintain meter because languages sound different. Uh, the whole acoustic level of signifiers you know, is stripped away. So when you're translating poetry, something you have to deal with is um, the fact that metrical systems, prosody, you know, differs radically between languages. Um, so even if you develop a, a rhyme scheme that is, you know, seems to be the same, uh, AB, AB, or whatever, it's not, it's not. Um, and accounting or understanding that difference, uh, I think is, some, is important. There are other examples that can be given. Um, it's possible to translate, uh, I'm suggesting one genre into another. Uh, it has been done you know, all the time. Um, I, I don't want to insist that um, that should not be done. Um, that is insisting, in order to say that should not be done, that, that Brecht should not be assimilated or translated into a Broadway musical, is to assume that the source text is completely stable. That it doesn't have multiple and conflicting interpretations as one of the conditions of its existence. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't think that we need to do that. Or to 
formulate it in a different way. In order to say that um, the choice of the Brechtian translators, the musical comedy, the music, Broadway musical uh, translators is wrong, we would have to fix our interpretation of the source text, um, which means that we wouldn't be really comparing the translation to the source text, but to our interpretation of the source text. Okay. Um, I think these are the ways we need to start thinking about translation, that no text is available to us in some unmediated form. As soon as we start reading a text, we are interpreting it. Um, and even when you know, the translator leaves out words, a translator may come along and say, I adhered to a concept of equivalence. So, you know, what do we do with that? Um, we can see this a lot in um, um, film adaptation, where um, a film adaptation would be considered as, you know, giving us the Shakespeare play, or this is Shakespeare even when entire characters are taken out or subplots or, or whatever. Uh, this, this is happening, you know, all the time. So um, the film adaptation is, is still considered as, as accurate or as giving us the spirit uh, of the source material. So um, I want to consider that, you know, there are different concepts of equivalence possible too. This does not mean just to be clear here, that anything goes. I realize it sounds like that, okay? Uh, I don't want to suggest that anything goes. Why not? Because translations, like any other, you know, cultural practice, uh, are housed in institutions, um, that they occur, uh, you know, among conditions that enable certain kinds of practices, uh, and exclude others, constrain. These practices are enabling and constraining, you know, simultaneously. So I don't want to consider, you know, translation as a as um, occurring in some kind of transcendental um, realm of complete freedom. <laughs> no, um, I want to think about translation always as situated in specific cultures at specific historical moments. Um, and that there are constraints. There's always that hierarchy of values in the receiving culture. And I use this term values, you know, as, as a shorthand for a whole range of beliefs, social representations, forms of language use, uh, literary traditions, uh, etc. cetera. There's, there's an always already situation for translations uh, like every, you know, cultural uh, practice. And with the translator, you know, they are specific to translation. And again, they're, they're at once enabling, enabling and, and constraining. So you can't do just anything <laughs> with translation. You know, that's important, you know, to realize. Um, and, you know, if you're doing a retranslation, you know, to take another example, um, one of the things is you have to deal, you should, uh, feel it's your duty or responsibility to somehow confront the previous translation or translations uh, and to offer a new interpretation to justify, you know, the very fact that you're doing it again. Um, so I, I want to look at translation uh, as a situated practice, but um, I, I think once again, to insist that we need to translate um, and I'm not suggesting that, you know, Hillary Brown is suggesting this, but, you know, um, I, I will take her example and, and try to, you know, uh, keep it on the table here. Uh, I don't want to suggest that um, a, a sonnet need be translated as a sonnet uh, all the time. I mean, uh, if, if we look at, you know, some of the great sonnet writers and see the way their work has been translated, we'll see right away that they've been translated in different ways for different purposes, for different audiences. And um, all of them, you know, can be valid. 
uh, potentially. So. Thank you, Larry. Just another question from Carlos Sullivan from Bristol University. I agree with many of the premises from which you proceed, but I have three comments. The first one, conventional discourse about translation has long been quite limited in its standard rhetorical moves, but it hasn't stopped many translations themselves being deliciously creative. Are you making slightly too strong a link between what is said about translation and what is actually happening in translations? That is the first comment. Would you like to take it and then I move into the second one or shall I read all of them? Yeah, well, actually, actually I, have, I, have, I have Carol's, you don't have to read them out, I'll spare okay. you that. I, I have Carol's um, comments right here. So, so let me just go through them. And um, uh, the first thing, um, um, yes, I mean, I, I don't, um, you know, I, I've gone over a, a number of uh, points, but clearly, you know, they're, they're going to get lost in the, uh, the, the torrent of language here. Um, but the thing is that, um, there's a lot of great translating out there. I would be the last person, you know, to, to say that every translator um, needs to have gone to a translator training program or needs to be immersed in, you know, translation studies or the history of translation theory. Um, you know, I, even, even before the recent, I'm gonna call it recent, the recent boom in translation studies. Um, there are generations of translators, you know, who were absolutely, you know, great. Um, and, you know, they, they start emerging. Um, in fact, um, uh, in our time at the beginning of the 20th century, um, you know, as someone who tries to think historically about translation, I, I think, you know, you, you see all kinds of variations when you start, you know, reading translations. I mean, I, I read translations from, you know, the 16th century, the 17th century, as well as the early 20th century. So, um, and, and you have to, you know, think about these in, in, in different ways. But if we just think about the present, uh, I, I would say that there are, you know, uh, in all the different spheres of translation, there is a lot. Um, of a very accomplished uh, work out there. And um, I, I don't wanna suggest that translator training programs have some kind of monopoly on the way um, translation uh, is being practiced or discussed or, or, or whatever. Um, but I, I don't want to seem um, as if I'm you know, manufacturing things. Uh, and I want to make sure that any critiques are rooted in, you know, specific research projects and, you know, what's available to subtitlers and what's being used in translator training programs. Um, therefore, without mentioning any names, uh, I, I gravitate toward, you know, the, the work that's out there. And uh, that's what I feel, you know, um, needs to be qualified. Um, so, um, it's, it's not that I'm making, uh, too strong a link between what is said about translation and what is actually happening in translation. Uh, it's, it's that what is said, uh, and being published by, uh, presses that have enormously wide global distribution, uh, and, uh, adoption, you know, as, as texts, uh, on courses and, and so forth, uh, I, I think there needs to be another understanding uh, of that, um, in the same way that, you know, uh, Henri Bayard, you know, who I interviewed, you know, about his translation of uh, the Le Cavalier film uh, Thérèse, um, you know, uh, was unable really to talk about his work that, um, you know, could help us appreciate it. <laughs> uh, it, it was it was striking, and he's not alone in, in this. He's very accomplished, uh, Henri. Um, you know, and, you know, very, very experienced, a huge volume of work. But, um, you know, the whole notion of ventriloquism, I think is something he doesn't, you know, quite interrogate, but he doesn't see that, you know, his, his own practice can be described in a way that goes in a completely different di direction. So it's, it, that's where I want to drive the wedge uh, in, in, you know, my thinking about, 
translation uh, in, in an effort to, you know, up the ante. That's it. So yes, subtitling uh, is also creative today. I mean, I, I began with that. This is Chris Durbin's um, initial point. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm, you know, uh, definitely entertained and getting a lot of grist for my, you know, uh, research mill, uh, but my watching things like, you know, Netflix, uh, you know, my beautiful friend, <laughs> for instance, the Elena Ferrante adaptations or uh, whatever. Okay. Um, the reality of, Carol raises the question about whether a return to the real world could also consider the reality of translators and readers um, to a model based on fidelity, fidelity to an author's intention, and why the con conduit metaphor has such a strong hold on us. Um, I'm trying to do that. <laughs> okay. the, the conduit metaphor, notions of fidelity, um, these are the ways um, that instrumentalism is still very much entrenched, deeply entrenched um, at a kind of pre-conscious or even unconscious level in thinking about translation. And the most accomplished translators, again, uh, you know, think about it in these terms. Um, it, it has been um, disappointing to see, you know, for so many years, decades, the way, you know, translations get reviewed um, and discussed as if they weren't there because there is an assumption that the translation is giving back, you know, the source text. So, um, you know, my, my struggle ha has always been how to challenge this. It's, it's not a question, uh, just to be clear here, I don't want to, you know, moralize. It's not a question of being right or wrong, even though I, I have a kind of ethical, you know, uh, justification ultimately, you know, for this. Um, it, it's more a question of what are we going to do to make the users of translators aware of what is at stake, even when they do not have the source language. It's a very, very difficult problem. Um, but the problem is exacerbated when uh, in, in the academy, um, the faculty, the staff who are using translations are also using them as if, um, you know, they were transparent, that they didn't exist. So, so how do we, you know, affect that uh, as well? Um, hence, ultimately, my work has become, you know, more and more basic, uh, in a sense. Um, basic in thinking about these deeply entrenched ideas uh, and, and this distinction between instrumentalism and, you know, uh, translation as a hermeneutic act is, is something that I've found very productive, partly because uh, it has a kind of flexibility. Um, to think of translation as an interpretive act is definitely uh, to bring in a whole, you know, fairly well-defined discourse of, about translation. But, but it, it, it tries to allow for the possibility that you can have different interpretations. <laughs> you can have different translations. Um, so I, I don't want to, you know, lock down, um, you know, how the interpretations uh, are done. Um, I, I think the first step is, is to become aware that there is an interpretive act with translation. Um, this is also the way to, you know, illuminate the way translation is a form of scholarship, uh, ultimately, a form of literary criticism or art criticism or whatever, film criticism, um, <clears throat> depending on, you know, the uh, field and discipline. So, 
so yes, I, I, I agree with many of uh, Carol's points. Um, however, the question remains, how do we mount this struggle? Um, this book I wrote, the polemical book, um, was, you know, one salvo. I hope it's not a candle in the wind, if I can say that without sounding too cliched. But, um, you know, the, the idea is to create debate about these issues. Um, and, you know, we'll see what happens. I'm aware that we're coming up to seven o'clock. Are you happy to carry on taking some questions? Sure, I'll take a few you... more questions. Yeah. Okay. And Thank then I'm going to need a drink, I think. <laughs> okay, we have a, a question from Marigo um, who says that she would, that um, I would say that subtitling is not just a special kind of translation, as you said, I think it's a special genre. What are your thoughts? Um, yes, I mean, I, you know, I, I could go with you there. It's not, um, you know, um, we would need to specify that. I guess the question for me is if we want to consider it a particular, you know, genre, um, what will that get us in, in terms of uh, illuminating, you know, what a subtitler does or how a, a subtitle functions in relationship to the audiovisual image? So um, if, if a concept of genre, uh, I, I have to say that I consider concepts uh, of genre provisional, okay? Um, and, you know, there, there's Aristotle, of course, uh, the poetics does not, um, you know, survive in toto. So, but when you look at what tragedy is, um, you know, there are many different forms of tragedy, even among the Greek texts, the ancient Greek texts that survive. So I, I, I tend to look at, um, uh, genre as um, um, either an ideal concept developed by the critic um, or something that is, you know, under construction, you know, during a critical act. Um, and ultimately the question is, um, for me, um, what is the payoff? Um, you know, how, how does it, how can we use it? How can we make it do things for us? Uh, to uh, extend our understanding of translation. So I, I have no, no problem with that. Thank you, Larry. Another question from Yi Tian. May I ask what is your opinion towards the binary understanding of the theories and ideas developed in, in translation? That is a polarized view that takes all terms at their face value regarding translation as moving back and forth on an axis as in many people's interpretation and application of ideas like formal equivalence versus dynamic equivalence, word-for-word -word translation and sense-for-sense -sense translation, translatability versus untranslatability, and unavoidably domestication versus foreignization. Is such simplified interpreting unavoidable because of how our brain works? Or is there a better way out? Um, thank you for this question. It, it offers me um, very interesting um, uh, opportunity. First of all, I think it has nothing to do with brain science, okay? Uh, thinking in terms of binary oppositions, uh, I, I regard as cultural. And um, I, I guess the key example that I would cite is the way um, my own work has been received. Um, I do not consider the terms domesticating, foreignizing, a binary opposition, okay? Um, I look at what I call foreignizing translation as in fact, domesticating. How's that for confusion? Um, all translation for me is domesticating. It's just that in the receiving situation, there are many, many different terms, all domestic, that a translator can use. Um, I think that a foreignizing translator tends to use those terms that are less familiar, but they're, and, and therefore, estranging or strange, unfamiliar to a certain extent to certain readers. Um, 
but but they're still mostly domestic. Um, so there's a slippage in these terms. Um, by foreignizing, I mean um, a translation that challenges the hierarchy of values in the receiving situation, linguistic and cultural values to start with. Um, it challenges dominant values in the receiving situation by drawing on terms that are not dominant, that are dominated or marginal or peripheral, however you wanna describe them, just not occupying that superior position. Um, and there are risks in doing this, of course, but it's important to see that the terms must come from the receiving situation. Otherwise, the translation risks unintelligibility. Uh, I'm gonna set that aside. Uh, I tried to address this in the introduction to it, the new edition of the Translators of Visibility. Hate to cite my own work like this, but um, uh, it's, it's something that you know, comes up, so please. The fact is that since antiquity, thinking about translation has been mired in cliches. Uh, and the very concepts, the very terms that emerged in antiquity, like sense for sense versus word for word, have hardened into cliches and proverbial expressions, you know, and uh, they are still, you know, very much with us. And in this thinking, there is a, a great deal, a, a number of, you know, binary uh, oppositions. Um, I think that binary oppositions, you know, like any set of concepts needs to be, uh, they need to be thought critically. And, um, you know, in themselves, they don't have any problems, but, you know, the difference between formal versus dynamic equivalents to take Eugene Nida who came up, you know, in the talk. Um, it's, it's more important that we think about, you know, what is at stake? with dynamic equivalence. I mean, how could he consider it a concept of equivalence when it's based on the effect of the text and when textual effects vary so widely, even within one culture, let alone moving between cultures. That's the kind of critical thinking I, I think that needs to apply with that. The same thing with word for word versus sense for sense. I mean, th this emerges in you know Roman uh, antiquity and um, Jerome, of course, you know, consolidates this. And since he's doing it in the context of Bible translation, um, it, it assumes a kind of value, a kind of authority for centuries, um, you know, down into the early modern period and beyond, you know, even today. You ask the so-called person in the street, what do you think of translation? And they're likely to say, well, you can only do it two ways, either word for word or sense for sense. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's, it's so very much you know, with us. However, for me, when I started thinking you know, about these terms, I began to realize how essentialist they were, how the sense for sense notion uh, assumes that the sense of the source text is just available. You just read it and, um, you know, you grasp it uh, as if it were some semantic essence embedded in the source text. That's what I mean by instrumentalism. The instrumental model emerges in antiquity, and it's not simply in the West, it's also in the East. You find it in the commentary on the Chinese translations of the Buddhist sutras. And um, um, that's more important, I think, to, um, to, to get to that or, you know, an understanding that is more critical. It tries to be more in incisive. Just dismissing a set of concepts because they seem to be a binary opposition doesn't get us anywhere, okay? Um, I mean, the, the, the whole fear of binary oppositions uh, is, is relatively recent, uh, in fact, and it emerges in, you know, French philosophy and post-structuralism. And, uh, of course, the, the king of the 
critique of binary oppositions is Jacques Derrida. Um, and he got tremendous, tremendous mileage out of it. And, and I am very much a student uh, of Derrida, uh, I have to say. But we need to understand you know, what's at stake uh, in, in co concepts that are arranged in um, binary oppositions. Uh, and of course, before Derrida, there were thinkers like Freud, who has a great essay called The Antithetical Sense of Primal Words, where he talks about you know, two meanings, binary opposition, um, you know, inherent or contained or signified for him uh, in certain key concepts. So um, I, I think that um, we need to develop a kind of, um, I think I'm paranoid, suspicion, <laughs> a kind of critical mentality toward everything um, and, you know, not be um, won over by easy dismissals of the thinking that's out there because, you know, it's just more of a nudie saying foreignizing translation is the best or uh, whatever. I mean, uh, why wouldn't I say that <laughs> after all? Uh, the question is, you know, is it being documented? Is it, you know, is it useful to us as researchers? So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, thank you. There's a question from Francesca in the question and answer. There is no denying that translation choices in the subtitle text can shape portrayals of characters, the narrative and so on in these films. Would you agree, however, that it is perhaps more a question of resources or lack of them in the audiovisual translation context rather than a lack of imagination on the part of the subtitlers and viewers? That many of these conventional subtitling methods are the product of numerous practical, professional and other constraints and powers? Absolutely. Yeah. But, um, you know, the fact is that, you know, subtitlers who do not undergo uh, training in a translator training course uh, can be experimental. And they've been that way, you know, for a long time. So um, I'm using the term imaginative as a way to account for the difference. Um, somehow they had an education, they had um, you know, a biography, an experience, um, a habitus, okay, if you want to dabble in jargon, sociological jargon, that um, enabled them to see possibilities that other subtitlers didn't. Um, and I fear, given the kinds of, um, you know, research um, being done in translation studies with it, it has has been done from the 1990s on in subtitling that there is um, um, there, there's just too much there that will encourage subtitlers from you know expanding the interpretive possibilities. Um, I mean, subtitlers you know need an education in film. They need an education in you know theory of adaptation. They need a, an education in literature given how much of film is, um, you know, um, involved in the adaptation of, of literary texts. Uh, and, and I think the more of that that a subtitler has, the more the subtitler will be able to see a variety of possibilities. So um, we can call it, you know, imagination, uh, a limited imagination or limited education or, or whatever. Um, we would have to talk about specific subtitlers and, you know, their biographies to uh, actually use those terms with, with more accuracy. Um, but, you know, maybe another time. Thank you, Larry. Another question from uh, Mahmoud. So thank you very much for your interesting talk. We can argue that resubtitling is a different form of retranslation, yet there doesn't seem to be any credits for the previous subtitle translators. In an era where fan subbers try to increase their visibility through yeah. notes or advertising the social media accounts, how do you think we should approach resubtitling in terms of copyright or translators' visibility? Oh yeah, there's, there's so many questions here. Please, uh, thank you, but it's a very um, you know set of very thorny set of issues. Um, 
I mean, you know, I don't even know if subtitlers are allowed to copyright, um, you know, their subtitles. Uh, they're given credits uh, on films or, you know, you know television uh, programs, but um, they never see, you know, the copyright sign. Um, a lot of subtitling is probably done then as work for hire. Uh, in which, uh, as we say in the US, I think that's a term in, in the UK uh, in copyright jurisdiction, um, copyright codes, where the copywriter, the, um, this, I'm sorry, the translator, the subtitler in this case, uh, essentially signs over the work to the person who is, you know, hiring him. Um, so uh, Chris Durbin says that in France, subtitlers are authors and get royalties. Well, that's great to hear. Um, I, I think that, you know, that should be worldwide, but I'm, I'm not sure that it is. As far as retranslations are concerned, that, that is a very uh, interesting issue. And, and again, you know, uh, the kind of work that I have been trying to do um, shows that it does matter that the, um, um, you know, the subtitler who is re-subtitling a previously subtitled film uh, is often doing a new translation. Uh, one of the films I've looked at, for instance, is the um, uh, Jules Dassin. That's the American pronunciation. He was an American director. Or Jules Dassin, uh, Rififi, uh, the, the heist film from the 50s which was, um, you know, re-subtitled uh, recently uh, for the Criterion Collection. And um, uh, one of the things about it is that um, the, the new subtitles just go so much further in bringing in, you know, underworld Argo and gangster talk and, uh, and, and so forth. Um, uh, so I, you know, um, that's the kind of thing, you know, we'd want to see. Um, there's a question I'm going to pick up here. Um, it's from someone named uh, Tillman Altenberg. Thank you, Tillman. Uh, why would slash should translators move away from what you have referred to as the instrumental model if that's what readers expect to find? Isn't there an, an element of self-indulgence? I, I guess the question is, is it self-indulgence on, on my part? Um, this is a good question. It, it offers me an opportunity to really clarify my, my point here. Um, these terms, instrumental versus hermeneutic, um, they are not ways of doing translations. They are ways of thinking about translations, of talking about translations, um, of receiving them and understanding what it is that a translator does. Um, I'm arguing that all translation is an interpretive act. And by all, I mean, first of all, what we call humanistic translation or translation of humanistic and um, uh, you know, uh, humanistic text types and genres uh, in the full gamut of the arts and human sciences. Um, it's probably easiest to see that translation is a form of interpretation in these areas, like, you know, philosophy, religion, <clears throat> history, uh, art history, uh, literature, uh, and so forth, film. Um, but I also want to consider translation um, interpretive act in so-called pragmatic genres and text types, uh, which is to say museum brochures, uh, travel guidebooks, um, restaurant menus, um, these kinds of pragmatic um, text types always include, you know, what might be called factual information. You, you need to have the museum's address in your travel guidebook so you can find it on the street. However, there is so much more. Um, there is a representation of 
the culture in travel guidebooks. And you can see this most obviously, I mean, we, we all are aware of this finally, it's, this is no great revelation. Uh, if you compare, you know, one line of travel guidebooks, like say the rough guide, which you know, is produced generally, the main office is in, is in London. Um, you compare that to, to something that is not so rough, if I could put it in those ways, like Fodor's or you know, Lonely Planet, which I hear may have gone out of business during the pandemic. In, in any case, um, they give different kinds of images or representations you know, of the foreign cultures. So there is an interpretive act there in the travel guidebook to start off with, which then gets translated into another language, another culture. Um, so, uh, but I also want to consider technical translation and interpretive act. Um, interpretation always works under constraint, under conditions that are at once enabling and constraining. And technical translation in, involves, you know, the same thing. Um, if it has a standardized terminology, uh, a particular genre or text type is not any less an interpretive act, I want to suggest. Okay. So, um, translators sometimes refer to their work in instrumentalist terms. I shouldn't say sometimes. It is dominant among translators. They really think that they're giving back, in many cases, the source text intact. And it's easy to show they're not. Um, there are different motives for them to insist on what is often called fidelity, a moralistic term. But what I want to suggest is that what they're describing in instrumentalist terms is fundamentally an interpretive act. And a different translator would come along and make a different interpretation. So um, it, it's not a question of choosing between these two terms for me. Okay. Um, it's, it's that instrumentalism does not describe what translation is and does. Whereas to think of translation hermeneutically gives us a more comprehensive and I think a more incisive understanding of translation. Okay, so I wanna get rid of instrumentalist terms in talking about translation, okay? There is no invariant. <laughs> That's what I want to argue. It, it may be hard to live with. I understand that. But um, until, you know, we understand that invariants are often created by researchers into translation, by analysts or critics of translations, um, we're not going to be able to see what it is that translation does that makes it relatively autonomous from the source text. Both of those words need to be emphasized, okay? It's translation is relatively autonomous. It must be connected to the source text. Uh, I'm not suggesting again, anything goes. If it's not connected to the source text, it's not a translation, it's something else. <laughs> you could decide what that something else is. It could be, you know, an adaptation. It could be just, you know, intellectual finger painting, whatever. Okay, um, but it's also autonomous, relatively speaking, because it's in a different language for a different culture. And it's different. And understanding and appreciating that difference is, is what we should be doing. So thank you for I that question. I think having kept you talking for, for yeah. two hours, that, that we should let you off the hook. I, we're very sorry that we haven't got to all of the questions because there has been such interest, but I want to say some very, very sincere thanks. In my introduction to this talk, I described Professor Venuti as a transformative translation thinker who pushes his reader to think about the borders and boundaries of translation and subtitling, um, the invisible and visible power that they wield as they make the world go round. And your talk certainly didn't disappoint on any of those fronts. Huge thank yous.
to Professor Venuti for an insightful, far-reaching and intricate analysis of not only how we subtitle, but actually how we consume subtitles. I can't think of a better way to have spent the past two hours. Um, I want to thank you, but I also want to thank um, Abdel Wahab Khalifa for organizing this and also Lal Davis for her support behind um, the scenes as well. I think it's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a great experience, exhilarating. And, thank you. Uh, it's my first Zoom lecture, you know, so um, I feel like I, you know, at least I got through it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us, uh, Professor Venuti. It has been an absolute pleasure. And for those uh, whose questions were not answered, I'll copy these and try to send them to Professor Venuti. And if he would like to answer them afterward, he will uh, surely do that. Sure. Uh, I, I would just like to thank Professor Venuti once again. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. They were great. They were great. Thank you very much, and, and it has been an absolute pleasure. And uh, for all the attendees, we have a talk in January. We will advertise this. These are our Twitter handles. Feel free to follow us, and uh, we will try to uh, send the details of the next talk for those that are going to leave their emails in the survey. So this is just a courtesy reminder about the survey following the talk. Thank you very much for joining us today. It has been an absolute pleasure and honor uh, having Professor Venuti. Thank you very much, Larry.